Welcome to the programme. I'm Nima Abuardi and we're at the marina in the Emirate of Ras Al Khaimah, which is at the centre of a tussle between two of the world's richest men to host one of the world's most prestigious sporting events. More on that later. Also coming up this week, a new era for Arabic on the web. But what will it mean for the region's fledgling online industry? Privatisation, Iran style, is the Revolutionary Guard taking over? And lights, camera and drama were on set of Turkey's newest soap opera, which is pulling in millions of viewers every day. There's been a buzz in the air here in Ras Al Khaimah since the summer, which is when the winners of the America's Cup chose this emirate as the venue for their next race. And preparations are well underway at this resort to host it. Behind me you see a seven-star hotel which will be open soon. But as of Wednesday, Ras Al Khaimah's hopes of hosting the America's Cup hang in the balance. Malcolm Bulwick reports. Over this bridge is one of sport's most prized assets. It's guarded 24 hours a day for fear of sabotage and espionage by the opposition. It was made in Switzerland, transported over the Alps to the port of Genoa in Italy, and then shipped to the Emirate of Ras Al Khaimah, which is where the Swiss Beta Alinghi team is currently gearing up to defend one of the oldest trophies in sport. This is the catamaran that Alinghi will be racing in the Americas Cup next year. They've been training out here in Ras Al Khaimah for the last six weeks. They're testing the sails, testing the performance of the boat, and basically trying to make sure it can go as fast as possible. And behind the two companies' boats are two of the world's richest men. The Swiss-based entrepreneur Ernesto Bertorelli founded Team Alinghi, who currently hold the trophy. And the challenger, BMW Oracle, is backed by this man, Larry Ellison, founder of the software giant Oracle. The build-up to the race in February next year has been far from plain sailing for Team Alinghi. Under the rules, the defender picks the venue. But BMW Oracle has successfully challenged Alinghi's choice of Ras Al Khaimah. And the court has ruled in favour of holding the event in Valencia, Spain. However, Alinghi says it will appeal this decision against Ras Al Khaimah. The American team, BMW Oracle, uh, their gamesmanship has, has been criticised, but they didn't go to court on the selection of this venue until we had arrived here. So we'd shipped all our equipment from Europe, we'd established the bases, but they wanted to disrupt us as much as possible and that's why they waited until uh, uh, beginning of October to make their complaint. BMW Oracle was not available for interview but they said that they welcomed the decision to hold the event in Valencia and told the BBC that they hoped Alinghi would now drop their appeal. One of the main fears cited by BMW Oracle in court was Ras Al Khaimah's close proximity to Iran and the risk of a terrorist attack if the event was held in the Emirate. So is it a safe place to hold the race? It is first of all 83 kilometres from, uh, from Iran and all the race needs 40 kilometres. Second, between here and Iran, uh, there are daily more than 40% of the world oil which is crossing the Strait of Hormuz and there is no problem. And there is no state of war today between the UAE and, uh, and Iran. And uh, UAE has been always a peaceful country and a friendly country. And Ras Al Khaimah is not independent, is not an independent state, is part of the UAE. Ras Al Khaimah was chosen to host the event because of its stable weather and sailing conditions. It's one of the most scenic emirates with its vast mountain range, mango swamps and flocks of flamingos and it's keen to diversify its economy into tourism and hosting sporting events like the America's Cup. Simon Meese runs a golf course at Alhamra Village, which is the resort that Alinghi has selected to host the event. Like many here, he says the America's Cup would raise the profile of this lesser-known emirate. No one really knows Ras Al on the world map. It would provide Ras Al a fantastic opportunity to, to come out of the shadow of Dubai Abu Dhabi, you know, they have the, the, the horse race and um, the Grand Prix now, just held last weekend. Ras Al Khaimah and Alinghi have invested tens of millions of dollars in preparing this venue for the America's Cup. The harbour has been dredged deeper, canals have been widened, and contractors are working hard to finish this seven-star hotel in time for the event. But although Alinghi set up camp here six weeks ago, the other side of the island, which has been set aside for BMW Oracle, lies empty. 
and for the moment, it looks unlikely that a Lingi's challenger will join them here. Malcolm Borthwick reporting. Internet penetration in the Middle East is low. It's thought that three quarters of the population never go online. Now, part of the problem is that the Latin script is used for so-called domain name extensions like .com. But as of next week, the company in charge of assigning domain names will start registering them in Arabic. Jeremy Howell has been finding out how this will affect internet businesses here. Typical teenagers locked in battle in their online Warcraft games at E-Zone in Dubai. In fact, they're a Middle East elite. It's estimated only 25% of the population here ever goes online. That impedes the development of online computer games and many other internet businesses which in other parts of the world now yield hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. Part of the problem may be the language barrier. ICANN, the company which assigns internet domain names, does not accept extensions for website addresses like .com or .org in anything but Latin script. So, in practice, Arabic language websites tend to have their whole address in Latin script. This is the Arabic language website of the BBC. To get to the site, you have to type in the address in English. Let's try doing it in Arabic. The page can't be displayed. That means that 210 million Arabs who spend their days reading and writing Arabic can't get anywhere on the internet at all unless they have some working knowledge of Latin characters. But all that's about to change. On November the 16th, ICANN will start taking applications for name extensions in different scripts, including Arabic. By mid-2010, companies and people will be able to register domain names written entirely in their native scripts. The change is coming at the right time for Souk.com, an e-commerce marketplace which is currently expanding from its base in Dubai to other parts of the Arab world where people are less familiar with the Latin script. There are a lot of users who today uh, don't know Latin characters and we've seen again and again that uh, native language uh, websites do very well locally and a lot of users like to use their native language on their platform, especially in the Arab world. So the easier it is for the user to get on the website, the simpler it's going to get for us to expand the service to this user base. F1 in Dubai is a fashionable haunt for net surfers. What do they think of the upcoming change? I'm using already in English, I'm using the internet since now eight years. The main purpose is that to get your site, whether it will be in Arabic or English, okay, it makes no difference at all. Arabic is the main language for us, but it will be very wonderful. I would like, I would like to create like this website by the Arabic website. In Arabic is better than French or English or any other language because this is my mother tongue. I honestly prefer everything to be in Arabic. It's easier for me and my fellow people. But the script change contains pitfalls for multinational companies. They're being warned to act fast to protect their future Arabic domains against cyber squatters. Companies in the region should be considering whether they've got sufficient Arab language trademark protection in place. Um, having an English language trademark does not necessarily give you automatic protection over the Arabic transliteration of your mark. That's important in case um, you need to take action to recover a domain name. If you don't have the Arabic language trademark protection in place, then you may be required to go to the domain name holder and negotiate for thousands of dollars to recover the domain name. Internet penetration is relatively low in the Middle East, but it's risen tenfold in the past ten years, spawning a variety of Arabic websites like Maktoub's Electronic Marriage Agency, which has one and a half million subscribers. The change to Arabic domain names could add another spurt to business. But to avoid crises with cyber squatters, companies will need to tie up the legal formalities. Jeremy Howell reporting there. Now, Morocco's economy is heavily dependent on Europe. Most of its exports end up there, mainly in Spain, Italy and France. But now Morocco wants to improve its trade with Northern Europe, as Juliana Lu reports. Mansion House is one of the most prestigious and historic locations in London's financial district. And it's from here that Moroccan officials hope to convince investors that theirs is a modern country open for business. 
It's the first such conference in London. We in Morocco are very aware of these challenges. The Moroccan ambassador to Britain, who is also a princess in the royal house, called for both sides to increase trade and investment. I think that in the past we have been too focused on, on, French, on France and Spain, and it's time today that we broaden you know, the base of our partners, and I believe that the UK is well positioned. I believe that the UK has this tradition of relocating, of outsourcing, and so it can be a good partner of ours. With an economy growing at more than 5%, Morocco hopes to become a base for multinationals to do business in North Africa. There is an opportunity for, um, you know, for Morocco to be a bit of a hub for financial services and other industries. So that's why I'm, I, I am genuinely excited about the opportunities for British companies. The country recently announced a solar energy project worth $9 billion, which will require significant foreign investment. It's an integrated and ambitious program that will help Morocco produce electricity for its own, but also to export electricity, especially to Europe, since Morocco has a very uh, interesting geostrategic situation at the crossroad of energy road. One of the richest countries in North Africa, Morocco is still plagued by unemployment. Its rulers want to modernize the economy, and they're counting on engaging the West to do so. Juliana Lu reporting there. Coming up after the break, how Turkish soap operas are taking the Middle East by storm. We meet the cast of the country's latest hit. <laughs> Welcome back to the program. I'm Nima Abuarte. To Iran now, where the country's Revolutionary Guard, that's the military force that protects the regime, has snapped up a controlling share in the country's telecoms company after it was put up for privatization. Many of Iran's business community now fear that the Revolutionary Guard are becoming too influential. The Revolutionary Guard earned notoriety for the heavy-handed suppression of protests following the re-election of President Ahmadinejad in June this year. But besides its security role, it has built up a multi-billion dollar business empire with interests ranging from oil and gas field development to construction. A consortium of companies affiliated to the Guards paid $8 billion for a controlling stake in the telecom company of Iran when it was floated on the stock market earlier this year. What's behind the deal for the Revolutionary Guard? A question I put to the chief executive of Enigma, Riyad Kahwaji. First, uh, they will be able to have a stronger control over the use of the new media, Facebook, Twitter. These were the main powerful tools of the opposition in getting their message out. So controlling telecommunication will give the guards uh, this sort of control and uh, will also will be uh, another step in uh, controlling the economy because the communication in uh, um, a way or another uh, controls many sectors the financial the economy all of them rely on the telecommunication infrastructure could it be said that this is a business takeover of a state the guards already have the military security power now they're moving to a firm control on the economic base, which until now is under the control or the monopoly of the Bazari, who lead the main markets in Iran. This move will come to complete the full takeover of all aspects and forms of power uh, and tools of power. Uh, inside uh, Iran. And where will this leave the privatization process in Iran? If you have uh, investors uh, from outside who are seeking to take part uh, uh, in the economy of, uh, inside Iran, uh, benefiting from the so-called privatization, uh, they will not be encouraged uh, to come in and compete against the guards. Uh, and therefore, this will discourage uh, many uh, uh, or great deal of the uh, foreign direct investment uh, um, and drive them away from the country. Riyad Qahwaji of Enigma speaking to me earlier. To Lebanon now and the country finally has a government 
five months after the general elections. The incoming Prime Minister Saad Hariri has formed the government of national unity, but will it be any more successful at solving Lebanon's economic problems than the last one? Lebanon sidestepped the global recession and its economy has been growing steadily over the past year. But the national debt now totals about $50 billion and the country is struggling to privatise its state-owned assets. So can the new government do any better than the last? Prime Minister Saad al-Hariri now is coming in fresh and I think he will try and approach that from a different uh, point of view, in my opinion. I think he will not be approaching it from the same point of view like Prime Minister uh, Senora uh, did where he tried to impose a solution for privatization on the opposition party, and he failed to do so. Ilyas Bussab, Executive Vice President of the American University in Dubai, speaking there. Right, let's take a look at some other business headlines in the region this week. Dubai developer Nakhil is offering investors on its stalled Palm Jamal Ali project alternative homes at other developments. This move has cast further doubts on the future of the man-made island development and has been criticised by investors who expected to move into their new homes last year. ExxonMobil and Royal Dutch Shell have won the right to develop Iraq's giant West Qurna oil field. It's the first oil deal by a US-led consortium in Iraq in more than 30 years. It's expected that a number of recent similar deals could boost the country's oil supply from just 2 million barrels a day to more than 10 million within the next 10 years. Construction has begun on a light rail project in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, aimed at cutting congestion in the city. Currently, 90% of the city's 6.5 million residents use cars to commute. The first phase of the project involves a 25-kilometre track and 23 stations. And a busy week on the region's stock markets. Here's a quick look at how they ended the week. And of course, if you have a story for us or want to comment on any of our stories, let us know. Our email address is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. Now, they were once the viewing choice of a few Turkish housewives, but almost overnight the country's soap operas have taken the Middle East by storm and created a multi-million dollar industry. Once unknown actors have been turned into stars and now the producers want their cut. But will it have a happy ending? In Istanbul, Ben Thompson has been finding out. <laughs> It's called Ask Imemnu, or in English, Forbidden Love. And as the name suggests, it has all the drama, angst and scandal you'd expect from a soap opera. But in a market awash with American imports and big budget dramas, homegrown Turkish TV like this faces some tough competition. And in a crowded market, falling ratings can mean cancelled shows. And that's something the producers of this show know all too well. Their first show, Noor, flopped when it first aired in Turkey in 2005. It came close to being axed. But then the Saudi-based broadcaster NBC bought the series and aired it across the Gulf. Such was its appeal that the final episode attracted more than 85 million viewers. And overnight, Turkish television took off. And so that means new series like this are now in high demand. This one is dubbed into more than 10 languages. And many foreign broadcasters have snapped up the rights to several series in advance. So just what is the secret of their success? We are interested is all about in Turkey. I mean, let's make a project which is going to be successful in Turkey. Then it happens to be successful in the other countries. So we are, when we are planning to make a new project, we don't think about at first me. I mean, up to this point, we weren't thinking about. Okay, let's do this for the Gulf region. The characters are good. The quality is okay. The drama is okay. The story is okay. Good. And the uh, when you look at the let's say competitors is somehow cheaper. And that's turned these shows into big business. They can film an entire series in just six days, with two writers working around the clock and two film crews working at the same time. And since the show is dubbed into so many languages, all the dialogue is recorded later, which means fewer lines for the actors to learn. And the star of this show is Kavanj Tatlutu. His character Belul has an affair with his uncle's young new wife. And whilst off-screen his life might be a little less controversial, the show and his character has made him into a household name. This is only his fourth TV show, but he's already attracting the sort of attention you'd associate more with Hollywood than Istanbul. This is incredible. 
This is all I can say, this is really incredible. And my agency gave me a call and they was like, Kwanch, you got an invitation from Dubai. You have big success there and you cannot imagine how much, you know, your success. I said, you're kidding me. And we went there. Finally, I saw the situation, yes. <laughs> yeah. Hundreds, thousands was there. And you know, they're yelling, crying, crazy things. <laughs> Sometimes it scares me because everybody knows you. You cannot even walk on the street, you cannot even shop. You cannot, you cannot go, no, nothing. <laughs> So for the network that commissioned the show, Turkey's Canal D, the programme's success is very welcome. And thanks to big ad revenues, it's also very lucrative. But if the actors are doing well and the network is doing well, how about the producers? When Turkish TV channels order the series, they buy all the rights. But when they sell it overseas, the producers don't get any money. But from now, that's changing. Producers will get a share of the revenue. In the past, 80% of producers didn't make any money, but from now they'll start to get their share. And so back on set, production is going at full pace. This show is now in its second season and they're already looking for the next big project. But in the meantime, the twists and turns of life here are likely to keep pulling in the viewers and of course the cash. Ben Thompson in Istanbul. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. I do hope you've enjoyed the programme. Next week, we're taking to the skies. Can Dubai's air show inject a much-needed boost into the region's aviation industry? Until then, from me, Nima Abuarte, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.